Well, the whole thing began, the recording aspect of it, when we tried to escape the studios. We had a great engineer called Martin Birch, but most of us felt constricted by the old um, procedures in recording studios. And believe it or not, the pattern was, when I started my recording career, you would walk into any studio and the engineers, who would normally be wearing a laboratory ja jacket or coat and smoking a pipe, would um, take all your instruments and throw blankets over them, either literally or metaphorically. And when you are asked why they were doing this, they said, well, because we need to have everything completely flat and then it's our job to recreate or create an exciting sound. When we said, but they sound great anyway, why are you destroying that and rebuilding it in a lesser way? They just looked at you as if you were crazy. So we wanted to escape the studio and play in barns, theatres, clubs, sports halls, whatever it was, and try and do a different way of miking things up, a different way of capturing the sounds. And so this all came together with the idea of going to Montreux. And the reason we were going to Montreux looking for venues was because Claude Nobbs, who is Mr. Montreux, was Mr. Montreux, bless him, uh, came up with the idea of using the casino. And we also acquired the Rolling Stones mobile studio. The mobile studios were being used more and more in those days to record live shows because they could get in and do a really good quality recording. But for a studio album, um, it was, I think we were only the second people to, to do it. And so we ended up at the casino. Frank Zappa and the mothers were the last show of the season. And so the show started. Then this guy came in over my right shoulder. I was sitting in the aisle boom, boom, and two flares went up like Roman candles and hit the, the wooden trunking at the top of the season. So that's how we got there and that's how it all kicked off. The fire yeah, put paid to all our plans of recording in a venue. Um, so Claude Nobbs actually was great. He, I mean, his whole career was going up in flames and yet he was concerned with us. Within two days, he'd found us somewhere else to record, which is in the pavilion, Le Pavilion. It's a small theater, wasn't far away from the casino. Luckily, we had still had all our equipment because Frank Zappa lost all his equipment in the fire. We set up and spent the afternoon, you know, plugging mics in and wires trailing everywhere. We weren't actually trying to capture it as a track. We were trying to get a sound balance for Martin Birch in the recording truck. As far as I recall, it was a sound check. Smoke on the I called it the Dan Dan song. Richie started playing this uh, kind of mid-tempo riff. And as usual, we all kind of joined in, see where it was going. And it sounded, you know, okay. And we very quickly threw, in, threw together an arrangement, which is a verse, which is a, a chorus, which is a solo and so on. Um, and it was done very quickly. And, and we must have started recording it somewhere around about midnight. We just knew the riff and we had a basic chord sequence um, and bluffed our way through it. The complete backing track was uh, done in that one venue, which was the ballroom in front of the Palace Hotel. It was a, a nice sound in there and it was very easy to play in there, but of course it wasn't built for loud music, it was built for people to dance in, listening to a, an acoustic band. As we stopped, we found out that the police had been hammering on the door trying to get in and our roadies were actually holding the door shut to stop them coming in until at least we finished that take. I think we got through it twice before uh, the police broke in and told us it was just too loud and we had to stop. And they said, you can't do this, you know, you're keeping the entire town awake. One of those two takes became the master backing track for Smoke on the Water. Had the roadies not kept the police out for that extra 20 seconds, it probably never been completed. So that was that. Um, now we're running out of time. So we spent another five agonizing days um, finding a place. We looked everywhere. We looked in the basement of the Palace Hotel. We looked in farms and barns and stuff in the countryside. And uh, then Grand Hotel was closed and we had a look at it and said, well, yeah, we could use this ground corridor. It's got, you know, got a nice reflective surfaces and so that's how we ended up there. We had high ceilings, we had bedrooms and a range of 
ambient acoustic opportunity. And yet you still had to separate the sound. We were di we were analog and there was only 20 tra 24 tracks available. And so eight of those went to the drums. Sound baffles and mattresses were a, a plenty in a hotel that's um, out of season. So we had no shortage of improvised equipment that we uh, used, plus a red light that told us when to start yelling. Well, we were just thankful to have somewhere to play, somewhere to record, because we were running out of options. But it was just a corridor with a little alcove off, off to the side where we put the drums, like a T section. And it seemed to work okay. The sound was contained, you know, with all the, the mattresses from the bedrooms. And we could hear each other clear enough, uh, together with the, the headphone sound, that uh, it, it gave the impression when we were playing of being semi-live. But it, we sort of knew what it was and acclimatised to it very quickly. Uh, it was a good little workplace, yeah. I don't think I ever saw the truck. I mean, I saw it parked up outside before the fire and they managed to get it out. And I saw pictures of it afterwards. I think I got in, I went in it once. It was so far from where we were recording, um, outside the hotel, that um, it was too much of a trek to get there. So I, we were just here through the talkback. Um, Martin would say, yeah, that's okay. That take, or do it again. We were seven minutes short of an album. In those days, in vinyl, the depth and quality of the groove in which the needle traveled, it had its limitations. And the optimum length of a vinyl album was 38 minutes, 19 minutes per side. Well, we didn't actually prepare many songs for the album. They were written and recorded right there and then. That's how, uh, how quick it was. Um, and we needed one more song. And, and uh, someone said, well, let's listen to that thing we did at the pavilion. Martin said we need another track and we only had a day left to do it so uh, it was daunting you know we could always try and write something over this track that we did at the soundtrack. As the uh, casino was burning down we're back at the hotel nice and safe <laughs> and uh, the downdraft from the hills above Montreux as the smoke was going up the wind pushed it down and it, and it was going across the lake so the smoke appeared to float across the lake, like a little very low, f dirty fog. And the word smoke on the water, which I came out of a dream I had a couple of days after the fire, well, let's write the song about this adventure that we've just been on. It was easy enough to write the lyric. It was a biographical account of the making of the album. It was so simple. Ian and I sat down to write it and we thought, well, let's just say it like it, like it was. You know, no, we're not going to fool anyone, it's just tell the truth, exactly how it was. Never thinking in a million years that that was going to be the song that would define us from then on. And maybe that's the, the value of it. If, if you tried to write a song that was going to define you, you'd never make it. It's got to happen, you know, organically, as they say. Once they got the idea in their heads about also just telling the story, I think it took them about 10, 12 minutes to write the whole tune. Write all the verses and the whole thing. Yeah. And the riff was fantastic. It was great enough when the guitar played it, but when the organ came in as well, it was just solid. It's not easy to write, especially a simple riff. It's easy to write a complicated piece of music, yeah. Uh, but it, it's much, much, much more challenging to come up with something simple that no one else has heard. And that's what that riff is. That's the magic of it. Within the other tracks, it just sort of fit nicely. We didn't think it stood out as anything more or less than the other tracks. Everybody knows the riff, but everybody sings, Smoke on the water, there's your hook. So you've got the, you've got the instrumental hook, then you've got the vocal hook. Well, that didn't exist. They were just, da, da, just two chords, you know. It's what uh, Ian and Roger came up with on the top of that which gives you the, the double whammy. You've got the great riff, then you've got the, the simple, totally memorable uh, hook line. You know? When it's finished, you realize, well, that, that actually sounds pretty good now. It sounds complete. That's the genius of, of lyric and top, top line writing. You've got a limited number of notes you can go to, but 
what word goes where, what's the length of the word, do you trill it, do you change it, do you shorten it? That's the magic. The more I, I talk about it, the more I listen to it, the more I play it on stage, I can, I can see the power it has. It, 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 I remember Steve once saying, if you, could, if you had a button that would turn the audience on, called Smoke on the Water, you'd, you'd be hard pressed not to push it. You know, It's just one of those magic things that happened to us. And, Thank God, you know, it's just, you can't plan that. That's, that's life just unfolding. And all you can do is hang on tight. Ah, break a leg, Frank. <laughs>